Steve. I know our audience has an interest not only in technology per se, but also in how technology is changing the way we work. In just the past month, the New York Times has run numerous articles on how this or that technology threatens to change, how we've historically done things, or bring about some fundamental change in the industry or how a firm operates. Here are some headlines. Self-publishing by authors threatens publishing houses. Computers grade essays, makes life easier for professors, allows students to get more feedback on their writing. MOOCs, educate the world and eliminate middle-tier universities. And there have been articles on Google Glasses, an article on turn your cell phone into a credit card reader. Similarly, 60 Minutes carried a story on how sensors will allow people less manufacturing. Producers of new technologies regularly traffic in claims about the miraculous changes that their technology will bring about. In the Valley, we even have a name for people whose job it is to sell us on the miracles that will be wrought by new technologies. Technology evangelists. See, what strikes you when you read this kind of article or hear about new technologies that are being evangelized? Peter, I suspect that some of these technologies will have significant effects, and a few may even transform our entire society, or at least continue transformations that are already underway. But most will actually be, have effects that are confined to particular jobs or firms or industries. And after 35 years of studying how technologies affect work, I'm skeptical of whether the effects that we anticipate when we adopt a new technology are the only ones that will occur, and more importantly, whether the effects we anticipate will turn out to be most consequential. History repeatedly tells us that the unanticipated consequences of technological change that bring about, are, are those that bring about uh, the biggest changes in our lives, our cultures, and society. In fact, I'm convinced that there's only one law of technological change, and since I don't have any grandsons that have been named after me yet, we'll just call this Barley's Law. Barley's Law says you almost never get only what you expect, and most of the time you don't even get that. The law has a corollary, and the corollary is, however, something happens. The truth is we typically adopt technologies only with what we might call first-order effects in mind. But it is usually the technology's second-order effects that pack the biggest wall. First-order effects tend to be economic. They increase efficiency, they save us time, they make us more effective, they reduce labor costs. They also tend to occur relatively quickly. They are practical in their orientation, or at least we see them as practical. They're relatively predictable. And by and large, they're not all that hard to measure. In fact, as Bob Thomas pointed out in his book, What Machines Can't Do, we usually can't get authorization to buy a new technology unless we can convince upper management that it will have economic benefits. So people go out of their way to make such a case, even if they want the technology for entirely different reasons. For example, simply because it's cool. This is the culture of business. Ironically, after demanding economic benefits, most firms don't ever bother to figure out whether they achieve them or not. Second-order effects are quite different. These tend to be socio-cultural. They change the way we see things, how we interact with each other, how we think of ourselves, our perceptions of time, our expectations of each other. These changes tend to be slow, but in the end, they're pervasive. They creep up on us. One day we wake up and wonder how the hell we got here. They're critical, but they're not necessarily practical. They're hard to predict, and consequently, they're hard to measure. Can you give us an example of a technology whose second-order effects have been more important than its first-order effects? Email is a good example because it's been around long enough for us to experience both its first and second order effects. Most organizations adopt email because it allows quicker communication, especially over long distances. It eliminates the cost of postage, stationery, secretarial labor. And it is an asynchronous medium. 
which allows messages and responses to be separated by a span of time. In other words, with email, we no longer had to play phone tag. Two and a half decades later, we're also quite familiar with the symptoms of email's second-order effects. Most of us feel like we're drowning in email. We even think we know why. First, there's constant spam. Then there's all the CCs we get that we really don't think we need it. Third comes email at night. Its arrival is relentless. Then there is the distribution list that usually carry relatively unimportant, if not actually useless, information. In fact, we are so aware of the overwhelming volume of messages we get that we complain constantly about not being able to get our real work done. Many of us see email as a significant source of stress. Several years ago, we did a study of communications and stress among employees in a well-known Silicon Valley firm. We asked 80 people across the organization to keep logs of every work-related communication they had over the course of three days, including evenings and at least one Saturday or a Sunday. We tracked not only email sessions, but teleconferences, meetings, voicemail sessions, um, and uh, face-to-face -face encounters, as well as phone calls. Then we had people fill out stress inventories. From all of this data, we could calculate the number of hours people worked on these days. After our informants completed the logs, we interviewed them about their work, as well as how they used and what they felt about each of the various modes of communication. Despite what people thought, the number of emails they received did not lead them to work longer hours. But the meetings and teleconferences that they took part in did cause them to work longer hours. Although the volume of email didn't matter, however, the time they spent doing it did. Time spent doing email was the strongest predictor of stress. More importantly, email was the only medium that elicited frustration and anger. Steve, why was this? If it wasn't the volume of email received, why did they blame email for the stress they felt? Why don't people just reduce the fire hose to at least a garden hose? The answer lies in email's second-order effects, Peter. There were three of these second-order effects. First were the cultural norms that arose around using email. People told us that they could not ignore email because they were afraid of missing something, that they would later be held accountable for not knowing. For this reason, they would not even ignore email from what they saw as mostly useless distribution lists. They also didn't use filters for this reason. They feared not seeing a message about which someone would later say, hey, did you read my email? In sharp contrast, people were rarely asked, did you hear what was said on the teleconference? If you missed a teleconference, everyone knew you missed it. An even more important norm was the expectation of responsiveness. In this organization, you were expected to reply to emails within hours, certainly within a day. This norm was both gamed and enforced. In order to get emails read, People labeled less than urgent emails, urgent. They had learned to copy coworkers and bosses to increase the odds that the target recipient would reply, which of course increased the number of CCs that people were getting. And if people didn't get an answer quickly, senders would call recipients on the phone and say, didn't you get my email? Finally, because email was asynchronous, people felt free to send messages anytime. People reasoned that email would not interrupt coworkers at home unless their coworkers wanted it to. But the fact, but in fact, right, it was it was an evening, or if it was an evening or weekend, didn't absolve the recipients from the obligation to reply quickly. Everyone told us that it would be appropriate to call people at night or on the weekend about work unless it was a true emergency. In fact, our informants received very few phone calls about work at home, but email was not seen as an interruption. So why didn't people just ignore the norms? 
Well, they were punished when they did. People who did not respond quickly developed a reputation for being a poor corporate citizen. People feared that such a reputation would block their careers. Another second-order effect was that email made it easier to use distributed teams. Most of the people we studied were on many distributed teams, and many of these teams included people located in Asia and Europe. If all you had were telephones, you would never try to call someone in Europe or Asia before or after your workday ended. But you would regularly send email, and they would send email to you. Thus, email from Europe and Asia would begin arriving during the night so that you were guaranteed of waking up to an active inbox. Because of this, you woke up feeling you were already behind the eight ball. The problem was exacerbated by yet another second-order effect, how the flow of email entwined with the flow of other communication events over the course of the day. This graph plots the frequency of email sessions against the combined frequency of phone calls, conferences, and teleconferences over the course of a 24-hour day. As you, can te as you can see, people started doing email between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. Their rate of doing email steadily increased until around 9 a.m., during which time the frequency of phone calls, meetings, and teleconferences also escalated. By 11 a.m., the phone calls, meetings, and teleconferences had become and remained more frequent than email sessions until around 3.30 in the afternoon when email began again became the most common form of communication. In short, people could not readily attend to emails that arrived during the prime hours of the day, so at the end of the day, they confronted a backlog of unanswered email, which others expected them to answer quickly. People therefore spent the early evenings finishing off email they couldn't answer during the day. In other words, because distributed teams and because of teleconferences, meetings and phone calls, email came to blur the boundary between work and home. It was not just the number of hours that people spent doing email that mattered. It was when those hours occurred that reinforced people associating email with stress. I mean, how many times has your wife chastised you for doing email at night instead of paying attention to her? Plenty of time, Steve. So why don't people complain more than they do about teleconferences, meetings, and phone calls? Well, it's legitimate to complain about email. Everybody complains. Even the CEO complains. But it's not legitimate to complain about being told you have to work on distributed teams or that you have to have teleconferences at all hours of the day, including the morning and the evening. Note that the red line on that graph starts to pick up at 6 a.m and doesn't fall to zero until nine. These are teleconferences with people in other time zones. Imagine that your boss, imagine what your boss would say if you complained as loudly about being on a distributed team as you do about email. You might get fired. It's simply not acceptable for us to complain about the business models that have been foisted on us. My point is, email has changed the way we live. But the change wasn't anticipated, and it probably could not have been anticipated. Nevertheless, it is these second-order changes that are most important in the long run. But surely there's something we can do. We could employ filters on our email. We could decide that we'll only check emails in batches. We could remove ourselves from distributions lists. But the evidence is that most people don't stick with these strategies for very long, out of fear of missing something, out of fear of falling behind, or out of fear of being deemed unresponsive and ineffective as a coworker. The only effective way I have seen to decouple email from stress and the anxiety has been when a CEO recognizes the problem and tells his or her employees not to answer work-related email before and after work. I know of one employer went so far as to have his IT people make the email, take the email servers offline after hours. In other words, Managers have to tell their employees they're not expected to do email all the time, and then they have to make sure they don't punish them for not doing so. In lieu of a systematic intervention like this, I don't think we are likely to be effective at dealing with this problem. 
you have any ideas about when we can expect a new technology to have significant second-order effects that will change an organization? You can be sure that technology will change an organization if it begins to reshape role relationships. Let me explain. Technologies change our work in two primary ways. They can change our practices, what we do and how we do it. In addition, technologies can change with whom we interact or the nature of the relationships we have with those people. In other words, when we do a job, we fill a role, and a role has two components the tasks that people perform in a role, and their interactions with members of their role set, that is, the other people with whom we have to interact in order to get our job done. If you're a technician in a radiology department, your task involves operating technologies, x-ray machines, CT scanners, ultrasound machines, to produce medical images. In the process of producing these images, you must interact with radiologists, administrators, and patients. These are the members of your role set. If you're a car salesman, your task is to show and sell cars. You do this by repeatedly engaging in a set of activities like taking customers on test drives and by using a set of props, including automobiles, brochures, databases, and so on. When selling a car, you must also interact with customers, other salespersons, and managers, and those are the members of your role set. New technologies almost always change our work practices, how we do what we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't adopt them. But not all technologies change with whom we interact or the nature of the relationships we have with those people. If these relationships remain unchanged, the organization remains unchanged, regardless of how much of change we experience in what we do or how we do it. But if a technology leads us to interact with people playing different roles than we interacted with before, or if it significantly changes the nature of our interactions, then we should see organizational change. Changes in role relationships alter the structure of the social networks that constitute a work system. Steve, can you give us a specific example of a technology that radically changed what people do, but not their relationships? Sure, Peter. For this one, we can stay close to home. Let's consider administrative assistants who used to be called secretaries and professors. The work of professors and administrative assistants are, well, are a well-known case of when technologies change what people do and how they do it, while leaving role relationships and thus the social order intact. As recently as the 1980s, administrative assistants answered phones, interacted with students, kept paper records of accounts, filed documents, and typed letters, memos, and manuscripts for faculty, who often wrote first drafts by hand. Today, administrative assistants continue to answer phones and interact with students, but few type documents for faculty. Professors now use microcomputers and word processing programs to create and revise their own documents. Administrative assistants have been removed from this process, an instance of what students of technology call disintermediation. As in the past, administrative assistants continue to manage accounts, but they do so using spreadsheets and computerized forms. As a consequence, filing no longer requires rooms filled filing cabinets. Because of the increased efficiency of producing and storing documents, and because the faculty have assumed the task of producing those documents, universities now employ fewer administrative assistants, and those who remain have required new skills and tasks, such as maintenance of websites. Nevertheless, administrative assistants continue to have roughly the same relations with faculty and other staff they had in the past. In short, what administrative assistants do and how they do it has changed, but their work relationships have not. So the way academic departments are organized today isn't much that different than how they were organized before microcomputers came along. What about a technology that's changed role relations and hence organizations? Radiology is a good example. Some years ago, I did a year of anthropological research in the radiology department of two community hospitals during the first year that they received uh, their first CT scanner. Like other computerized imaging tech modalities, such as ultrasound, digital subtraction, and angiography, CT scanners radically altered the work of the x-ray technicians who were assigned to run them. 
Technologists who run computerized technologies have to know how to read the films that they're producing in order to capture diagnostically useful information. They also have to know something about computers. This is quite different than traditional x-ray work, where you can produce a medically useful image largely by knowing how to position the patient's body relative to a cathode ray tube. The upshot was that texts around the computer modalities developed a very different relationship with radiologists. Not only did they interact more with radiologists and far less with administrators, but their conversations with radiologists often focused on pathology, which was quite rare in standard x-ray. I can show you how this changed the organization. During the study, I measured who needed to interact with whom according to job descriptions. I also used questionnaires and observations to figure out who was actually talking to whom regarding the work that actually goes on in the radiology department. Here's a network of the radiology department based on job descriptions. The radiologists and administrators are equivalent in the sense that technicians report to both. Moreover, all the technicians are the same. They report to the administrators and the radiologists, and they don't have interactions with each other. The department, as you can see, is tightly integrated into one structure. In fact, you see a classic dual hierarchy of a hospital. Here's the actual network of relationships. The network indicates the day-to-day -day reality. For all intents and purposes, the radiology departments are, de are consisted of two different worlds. One centered on routine x-ray and fluoroscopy. It was run by administrators to whom the x-ray text reported. And notice that information flowed up from the x-ray text to the administrators, but not down. The other segment of the radiology department was run by the radiologists. The various texts operating the computer modalities interacted professionally with each other as well as with the radiologists. Even the nurses were involved in the network. And interesting, so were secretaries who booked CT scans. One side of the organization, the left side, was a classic bureaucracy. The other was a network of collegial interaction. This is how computer imaging had changed social organization of radiology over a number of years. Thank you very much, Steve. I learned a lot this morning about an area that's shaping our society and that's having a lot of impact on technology companies, both in terms of how they function internally and how they deliver services to their customers. Steve is one of a number of top Stanford faculty participating in the Stanford Executive Institute. This institute has been delivered annually every summer going back to 1975 and is our department's cornerstone executive education program. This program provides participants with the general management and leadership tools that have proven successful in the technology environment. Unlike many other programs, the teaching cases focus exclusively on technology management and we carefully select our participants from technology companies. Because of its technology focus, there's no better place than Stanford University to deliver a program of this kind. We select faculty as teachers based on both their teaching ability and on their knowledge of a high-tech environment. Through case studies, cohort discussions, personal coaching, team projects and presentations, participants acquire tools and approaches to take their organizations to the next level. Participants learn about business strategies relevant to the high-tech industry through use of pertinent case studies and discussions with high-tech executives. They gain perspectives from nationally recognized faculty and industry leaders, aligning business principles with real-life experience. They identify practical solutions to business challenges facing today's tech executives. They practice entrepreneurship and bring innovative ideas back into the organization. And finally, they identify management techniques for rapid growth, competition, and innovation. Specific topics included in the program include accounting, finance, leadership, marketing, negotiations, and innovation. Allow me to read a couple of quotes from recent participants in our institute. This is one from John Lamanchek, Vice President for Silicon Image. Quote, since graduating from the institute, my increased understanding of business processes, marketing, and general management has helped me grow our business over 50%, unquote. Another quote from John Garrettum, manager for the Boeing Company, quote, truly a great opportunity for those endeavoring to run a high-tech business in today's environment. The program's intense with just the right balance of depth and breadth 
would be directly applicable to enterprise leaders, unquote. This year, the Stanford Executive Institute will run here at Stanford from August 4th through August 10th. As chair of our department and one of the two academic co-directors for the Institute, I encourage you to consider this program seriously if you wish to enhance your technology management skill set. Steve, we have an opportunity now to take some questions from our audience. So, question number one. Steve, do you see any emerging technologies on the horizon in which similar impacts will be felt on the way we work? Well, there are undoubtedly quite a number out, Peter, but the one that I think is going to have the longest term and the impact, one that would be building on what's already been taking place as opposed to suddenly change things in a different direction, is the use of uh, uh, sensor technology in manufacturing. Um, it is uh, increasingly uh, common uh, using sensors and effectors. Uh, we might call them robotics. We might call them artificial intelligence. But it's really the core of it is sensors and information transfer. What this allows people to do is to build manufacturing plants uh, in which you really don't need traditional workers. Uh, you need technicians uh, to maintain the system. Um, but most of, uh, in these kinds of plants, you can, in many of them, you can, at least in some types of plants, you can uh, bring your raw materials in and not have a human being touch them uh, until it's time to put them in a box and send them away. This is going to have a major impact on uh, the availability of manufacturing jobs, not only in uh, the, um, not only in the developed economies of Europe and North America, but it will also eventually have a significant impact elsewhere in the country, which means the job structures are going to change, and uh, it will have uh, significant implications, I think, for worldwide employment. So do you have any sense at this point as to what the potential second-order effects might be in this case? Well, if you think about a large group of people, uh, being not able to work, perhaps because they don't have uh, the skills necessary to get a different kind of job, um, then you have large-scale second-order effects. You have you know, unemployed, you're likely to have unemployment rates that are going to rise. They will they will change. What will change about them is, you know, we will no will no longer consider, uh, you know, three percent, four percent, five percent. Uh, unemployment as typical, uh, we'll be talking about higher levels of, uh, of continued unemployment. Um, you can think about uh, it, will, it will probably also change the structure of organizations even more. Imagine running a plant, an entire production plant, with simply management and a cadre of technicians. It will make most manufacturing look more like uh, it will make batch manufacturing look more like continuous flow processes. Uh, that is gasoline refining, chemical production, so on and so forth. Thank you, Steve. Um, here's a specific question of a particular industry segment, in particular robotic surgery. How do you envision this technology changing the surgery workplace? Robotic surgery is really quite interesting. I'm not an expert in robotic surgery, um, but I would say there's two components to this. One is that the robot actually does the surgery, and uh, the second one is what's the role of the, the human being with respect to the robot. Um, I don't believe, but it could be wrong, that uh, it's now possible to program a robot to do surgery in the same way that you can program a robot in, a, in an automobile plant to paint a car, meaning it runs entirely off of its own program uh, and, and uh, you don't need human intervention. That's not my understanding how robotic surgery is currently done. My understanding is that it's done with surgeons and technicians beside the patient, and it also opens up the possibility of doing surgery from afar. Uh, so that uh, one could have a surgeon located in California and a patient located in West Virginia, for example. Um, 
this is likely to have a major impact on surgical theaters, uh, particularly the, the use of uh, distance robots to allow distance surgery. Uh, most well-operating surgical theaters today uh, involve um, tight relationships between surgeons, anesthesiologists, and nurses, and technicians. In fact, data show over and over again uh, that surgical teams that have ongoing experience with each other are far more effective than surgical teams uh, that rotate in and out. And uh, so to the degree that we begin to experiment with robotic surgery and it becomes common, you can expect, I think, unintended uh, decrements uh, in uh, the precision with which surgical teams and, and the, you know, work with each other uh, in, a, in a surgical theater. Very interesting. I think many of the participants who may be listening in today may have a technology management focus. Uh, are there any principal takeaways in terms of what we've been covering this morning that are uh, particularly relevant for technology managers? In particular, what should they be mindful of? What I would urge people to think about as they adopt new technologies, and the hard thing in thinking about it is you never really know exactly which ones are going to have second-order effects. And the, um, uh, the reason for this is these second-order effects accumulate gradually. But having said that, uh, what, I would, what I would recommend or what I, is, is vigilance. Um, when you adopt a new technology and people begin to behave differently uh, than they did before, uh, you might ask yourself, well, is this something we want? Uh, in the case of radiology departments, it certainly improved relationships between radiologists and technicians. Uh, or is it something we don't want, and what can we do to intervene? And I would argue that the role that email has played in our lives is like that. However, we've now built such an infrastructure around using email to communicate uh, that I can't imagine, uh, I can't imagine us being willing uh, to put large, widespread restrictions on how people actually communicate day in and day out with, with email. We'll just need to learn to live with the stress. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, here. Let me just take the opportunity to maybe push a little bit further afield and just uh, ask you, What's the most interesting recent research finding that you developed? What's my most interesting research? Recent research. Recent research finding. Yep. Well, we recently completed a study of how the Internet has affected automobile sales. And um, what we found was quite interesting. Most, most dealerships adopt the Internet to sell cars in order to compete with their competitors. Uh, and to increase volume. What we found was that it has an unexpected and unintended effect on the relationship between salespeople and car buyers. So let me tell you what we did. We went out to two, we went out to two large dealerships. One was a Chevrolet dealership and one was a Toyota dealership. We spent a year and a half following Salespeople, from uh, as as customers would come on the lot, um, we even recorded interactions between salespeople and uh, their customers. And initially, we thought that there would be differences in the way Chevrolet and Toyota sold cars based upon the kinds of differences, at least historically, existed in the way they did their manufacturing. And we found none of that. But what we did find was that there was a massive difference in how People, how salespeople on the floor sold cars, and how people who uh, managed Internet sales sold cars, and more importantly, the nature of the relationships that develop between the customers and the salespeople. To tell you precisely what I mean, and everyone who's ever bought in a car will know this, uh, the, the, the typical plot of a sales encounter 
with a floor salesman is you will be greeted by the salesperson. The salesperson will begin to notice things about you that he or she can use to develop a sense of similarity. Uh, eventually, you'll get asked to take a test drive. You come back from the test drive, and then and only then will the salesperson sit down to negotiate price. Now, everyone, at least Americans, hate buying cars. And the reason they hate buying cars is because they don't trust car salesmen. You know, it's a cultural image we have. They, uh, they're, they're, they lie to you. Uh, they engage in uh, behaviors that are uh, uh, unethical. Uh, now, Steve, I hope that there are not too many car salesmen listening this morning. <laughs> Now, what happens then is that these relationships break down into conflict. With the Internet sales, the very first thing that is talked about is price. You don't come in and drive a car if you come through the Internet until you've settled price. More interestingly, the floor salespeople begin with MSRP and work down to find a price. The Internet salespeople work with invoice price and will typically say your cost will be invoice price plus $300, $400, which will be our profit. So this, so this totally changes the nature of the relationship between the customer and the salesperson. We documented a far less conflict and far less untoward interactions. And we also um, found that Internet salespeople were actually in the, uh, the most successful of all the salespeople in the, the dealerships that we studied. So, Steve, I have a follow-up question on that. Have you seen that same kind of interaction uh, live versus kind of using technology or, or uh, you know, computer technology, com computer communications in customer service? I mean, kind of has, has that like with chat versus talking to somebody live? Have you been able to study anything in, a, in effect there? Well, Ryan, I haven't studied customer service, and as an ethnographer, I tend uh, not to generalize far beyond the sites that I've studied. <laughs> Sorry, it seemed to me I've done a lot of chat, so I'll have to... Uh, interesting. Thank you. Okay. Well, Steve, thanks very much for that uh, really interesting conversation. We've learned a lot about... Uh, the workplace environment and the impact that new technologies can have on the workplace environment. We've even learned something today about uh, negotiating price with car dealerships. They've covered a lot of territory here. Uh, Steve is a uh, wonderful asset for Stanford Executive Institute that we run every summer, and I'm looking forward to working with you in August on that program. Thank you, Steve. <laughs>